It's a great a pleasure for me to be sitting next to the preeminent theoretical physicist of his generation, uh, Nima uh, Arkhani Hamed, whose uh, breadth and depth uh, never ceased to uh, amaze me. Believe me, you're in for quite a ride uh, tonight. What I'd like to do is to spend the first 15 minutes or so just giving an, a, a sense of context. We're talking tonight about the future of fundamental physics, so I just wanted to get a sense of where it is now and some of the big questions that Nima and his colleagues are, are, are looking at. So, Nima, let's, uh, let me ask you uh, to uh, summarize what you think are the key results of uh, 20th century physics in, say, the next two or three minutes. That'll, that's easy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We learned in the 20th century that um, uh, this incredible variety of phenomena that we see in nature, um, uh, many of which on the face of it seem utterly unconnected to each other, are in the end uh, a consequence of a few very, very simple basic general principles. Some of these general principles we didn't even know about um, uh, 100 years ago, but, but we discovered them in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, there are the, these are the, the basic principles of the laws of uh, relativity as discovered by Einstein and the laws of quantum mechanics. And those were the two big revolutions of the first part of the uh, 20th century. And, and, and much of the rest of the 20th century was devoted, to figure out, uh, was devoted to figuring out how these two great principles could cooperate with each other and, uh, could, uh, uh, and uh, simultaneously uh, describe uh, how everything around us uh, actually works. So uh, we discovered that this tremendous variety of phenomenon actually uh, boils down to very simple interactions between elementary particles. And the kinds of elementary particles we're allowed to have and the sorts of interactions they're allowed to have are very largely dictated by these general basic principles. It's an amazing fact, something that, that we didn't even quite appreciate 50 years ago, but, but which we appreciate and, and understand very well now. Um, the structure of the laws of the universe at sufficiently long distances, uh, the sort that, that, that we probe, where long distances here even means the tiny, tiny distance scales that we're probing <laughs> at experiments like the LHC. But the structure of the laws of nature at sufficiently large distances is almost completely dictated by these general principles of relativity and, and quantum mechanics. And uh, the story of the Higgs boson is essentially the completion of that structure. So we, 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 many of us knew the Higgs had to exist for a long time. Uh, we believed on theoretical grounds that it should exist. Um, it's actually quite shocking that something as simple as the Higgs uh, is associated with the phenomenon that it does explain, but, but many of us anticipated that it should be there. And it's an incredible triumph for experiment, of course, it was discovered. Um, but it was also a, a triumph for this uh, theoretical structure that, that we've built up over the last uh, century. And so finally, we're at a, we're at a point uh, by the end of the 20th century, which, as uh, Graham was suggesting to me the other day, should be defined uh, by a physicist as July 4th, 2012. Um, and uh, by the end of the, of, of the uh, 20th century, when the Higgs was discovered, um, uh, we have uh, a basic understanding of how things work, the mechanics of how elementary particles interact with each other, and at some you know, zeroth order, how the world works. And the questions that are then on the table for the 21st centuries are, are, are deeper structural questions about why we got the sort of universe we got, which turned out to be incredibly strange and, and bizarre, and we'll, uh, I, I assume we'll spend some time talking about it. Mm -hmm. You make it sound a bit easy, if I may say so. Uh, you, yeah, you, you really say that there are two theories, the, the quantum theory, uh, which, which began its life 1900, uh, then became through the hands of people like Dirac and Heisenberg a, a theory of nature on the small scale, and you have relativity, which in its general form is a, a theory of the, the, the giant force that shapes, shapes the universe. Are you really saying that all the stuff we've been hearing about quarks and strangeness, all, that, all these are details compared with uh, uh, th those giant theories? They're very, very important details, uh, but, uh, but um, uh, it if I could describe it in the following way. Um, you could imagine uh, handing a bunch of sufficiently competent theoretical physicists. They have to be sufficiently competent. So <laughs> for example, I, I wouldn't be able to pull it off. But, uh, but you'd have to give sufficiently competent theoretical physicists these basic laws, that, the, the basic principles of, of, of relativity, of special relativity even, and of quantum mechanics. And you could lock these theoretical physicists up in a room and refuse to let them look at the world outside. And just ask them what kind of universe 
Could you imagine that that's consistent with these general principles? And uh, they would discover something very interesting. They would say, look, if we only had quantum mechanics, there are zillions of possible universes we could imagine, even zillions of kinds of laws, uh, zillions of kinds of elementary particles. Uh, or if we just had relativity, there's gazillions of possible universes uh, uh, we could imagine with their own details. But you take these two principles together, and all of a sudden, it's shockingly difficult uh, to make anything consistent with both of them. And things boil down very quickly to a tiny menu of possible kinds of elementary particle and a very tiny menu of possible ways they can interact with each other. Uh, so that, uh, th that doesn't mean that, that you can uniquely predict what the universe looks like. Mm -hmm. um, we have particles like quarks and electrons and photons and uh, gravitons mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, we, can't, we can't predict ahead of time uh, exactly how many of each kind of particle there are and the strengths with which they interact with each other, but uh, there's a very small menu that we get to choose from. And all of our uncertainty about uh, all the choices in what the universe can look like, it just boils down to choosing out of that uh, menu. Uh, and so that, that's a tremendous accomplishment. It's, it's, it's an enormous reduction in our freedom uh, for, describing, uh, for describing nature. And um, the fact that we've discovered that these basic principles continue to hold and they continue to describe uh, the structure of all of matter, all of the forces as, as, as we understand, down to the tiniest distances that we're exploring at the Large Hadron Collider. I, I remind those of you who don't know, we're, describe, we're, we're, we're probing distances that are around a thousand times smaller than the nucleus of the atom at the LHC. The nucleus of the atom itself is around a million times smaller than the atom itself. <laughs> okay? So, so we're, we're talking about unbelievably tiny uh, distances, which we need unbelievably high energies to probe. And the same basic principles continue to work. Uh, and in fact, the Higgs had to be there. The Higgs had to be there in order for these basic principles not to break down. So that's, that's, why, uh, that's why it's a real uh, triumph of this whole structure that was handed down to us by our intellectual ancestors in the early part of the 20th century that uh, all of these things uh, continue to work. Okay, uh, I don't think anyone's going to disagree with you that if you go to uh, the Large Hadron Collider, you go to the other particle physics laboratories, you and your colleagues have done a great job at predicting to umpteen significant figures what the results of the experiments are. You've, ju you've just said that. But hold on, let's, be, let's just be uh, boring realists for a minute. If I ask you or your colleagues to predict the variety of organisms in this room, the distances between the planets, the size of the sun, could you do that? Nope. Does that not worry well, you? Actually, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, I was too quick. We can predict the size of the sun. Uh, there, 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 there are some, there are some, uh, there are some very basic things like that that actually follow quite beautifully from general principles. Um, uh, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but some, but some, many complicated uh, and very important and fascinating um, uh, phenomenon, uh, which 99.99 percent of science concerns itself with understanding. Uh, is not what we're, what we're talking about in this business. Um, uh, we don't need all of the uh, fancy schmancy uh, business about quantum mechanics and relativity even uh, to, to get to a situation where you know, almost all of the world around us is, is, uh, is governed into a very good approximation by classical physics. And yet, uh, we don't understand if, if you give me, a, if, if, if someone's smoking, I don't know if anyone does that anymore, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, you, you watch the, the smoke coming off the end of the cigarette Mm -hmm. And you see these like beautiful, strange, chaotic, turbulent patterns it makes as 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 it rises. We don't understand how that works. So that's something mm -hmm. that uh, that where all the essential equations that govern that phenomenon were understood already in the mid 1800s, and yet um, there are complicated phenomena that 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 arise from 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 solving them, uh, which which we still don't understand well uh, to this day. So there's all kinds of things about uh, the world around us that are complicated emergent phenomena from the simple, basic uh, underlying laws. It's, that's what most of science concerns itself with quite properly. Uh, but in our part of physics, in, in fundamental physics, we have a, a different goal in mind. We're, we're trying to understand, in the simplest possible way, uh, the smallest set of basic principles from which everything else in principle follows. And uh, one of the reasons we do this is that it keeps working. It, it's, it's very surprising that as we continue to understand things more and more deeply, fewer and fewer principles uh, underlie more and more divergent uh, phenomena. 
And since we've been on that track, really ever since Newton got us started down this trajectory uh, 400 years ago or so, mm -hmm. um, uh, we keep understanding that things that appear on the face of it to be completely different. You know, uh, Newton told us that, that the same force that drags uh, the apple uh, to the earth is what keeps the moon going around the earth. Now, that's insane, right? <laughs> it's, it's totally not obvious that something like that is true, and yet it's true. Uh, and later we discovered that, uh, that things like electricity that the ancients knew about from lightning and magnetism, that they had these funny rocks that sometimes repelled each other and sometimes attracted each other. These were different aspects uh, of the same thing. As we keep learning more and more, we discover that more and more disparate phenomenon uh, um, at the bottom, at the most basic level, are described by fewer and fewer principles. And the 20th century, uh, took that trend of, uh, of unification into much deeper territory, much further removed from ordinary human experience. Um, uh, but even more and more so, I just claimed a moment ago that, that a very few, two basic principles almost completely characterize and dictate what the world can possibly look like at, at, at long distances. We find this fascinating, mm -hmm. and, uh, and this part of physics is not concerned itself with explaining all the rest of the incredible variety of phenomena mm -hmm. in nature, which is amazingly interesting, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but trying to, to, to understand in the opposite direction the extremely simple, ultimately mathematical principles that seem to underlie it all. Mm -hmm. It doesn't worry you, though. But we can't explain the size of the sun and the size of the earth and all sorts of, you know, any gross feature of the universe around us, any decent theoretical physicist should be able to estimate and explain to a, to a factor of two or three. Okay, so but, but it doesn't trouble you that if you say, if some, uh, some little child says, Nima, can you explain the shape of this cauliflower? You can't do it. Uh, no, absolutely right. can't do it. I mean, uh, does it? Uh, uh, I mean, it doesn't trouble me. I'm just as uh, I'm just as interested as the next person about, right, okay. about what 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 uh, about where those things are. Right. Of course, they're 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 wonderful, complex phenomena that uh, yeah. that uh, that somehow somehow arise from these basic un un underlying laws. This is incidentally, it's a really deep thing. We don't have a very good understanding for why it is that the laws of nature organize themselves in this strange, wonderful hierarchical way. Uh, so that really simple underlying laws at, at, at short distances, uh, at long distances are replaced by new sort of effective principles and at longer distances by other effective principles and so on. I mean, well, we understand in many ways technically how it works, but at, 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 a, at a deep level it's still rather, rather mm -hmm. mysterious. Mm -hmm. Okay, now one of the things that we've, we've got to get right is that uh, you, you said about all the great things that science has done, but the thing that keeps scientists busy uh, is that they basically work on problems the whole time. Right, so you said that this is a great triumph, that we've, got, we've completed the standard model, as it's called, uh, based on special relativity and quantum mechanics with the uh, Higgs, Higgs boson. Just, can you uh, just give us a, a selection of, uh, of the things that keep you awake at night, the biggest problems that you see with the kind of physics you've been talking about? You well, can't think of any? No, no. <laughs> it's not, that, it's not, it, it's not that, 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 that I can't think of any. It's that, you don't know where uh, to start. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know where to start. No, so um, uh, I, I could summarize what, what we said before about uh, 20th century physics by saying that in, in some ways uh, these, these big revolutions of the first part of the 20th century uh, taught us that uh, relativity and quantum mechanics largely make the structure of the universe inevitable, which is amazing. Um, but uh, if I had to summarize in a slogan what the difficulty is uh, with physics today, and in a sense, we have to plow through understanding all these things to come to this point to be able to ask, uh, really, uh, I do want to emphasize this. We're not at a garden variety location in the trajectory of, our, of, our, of, the, of the development of our field. Um, uh, we're, we're, at a, we're at a rather special time. Um, uh, in that we're starting to ask essentially new kinds of questions which are rather different in character than the questions that, that we're asking than we're asking before. And, and as I said, they're, they're deeper, they're more structural. Um, much of the 20th century was devoted to developing the principles that we learned about in the early part of the century. And now, uh, from a variety of points of view, we have some, some, some fundamental difficulties with these ideas that we have to uh, overcome. So, and there are really two classes of, of questions. Uh, uh, the first is, uh, uh, is in a sense the most profound um, uh, and most deeply conceptual difficulties. Uh, these two basic principles of relativity and quantum mechanics, and in particular, uh, uh, what relativity taught us is that we shouldn't think of space and time as 
two completely different things, but they're somehow merged into this idea of space-time. And furthermore, that as things move around in space and time, they, they interact with each other, not in completely random ways, but only when they eventually touch at points in space-time. Um, so uh, that idea, uh, the idea that, that, that there is an underlying space-time, uh, we know from many points of view, theoretical, from many theoretical arguments, uh, we strongly believe, maybe no is too strong a word, but we very strongly believe that space-time doesn't really exist. And, we, and somehow has to emerge from more primitive building blocks. So that's the, so the oh, slogan hold, is... Hold yeah. on a minute. You say that, say that just, just a bit more slowly. You are convinced that space-time doesn't exist. Yeah, so the, the slogan we all like to say is that space-time... Does this worry is, you, ladies and gentlemen? Right. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh. the, 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 the slogan is that space-time is doomed and that something has to replace it. Um, right. Okay. That's the first problem. Uh, <laughs> right. And then, uh, then um, uh, a little bit closer to home, there's another class of, of questions about the universe. It's such a simple question. You would think we'd have an awesome answer to this question before moving on to all the fancier things that we spend all this time talking about. But, but it turns out we do not have an awesome answer to this question, quite the opposite. Uh, one of the most basic features of the universe is that it's big. Um, the universe is a big place. It's an enormous place. Um, and yet, it's made out of microscopic things. Right? And, and as, as we've discovered over the last hundred years, uh, not only is it ultimately the basic constituents and the basic interactions of all of these little point-like elementary particles that are whizzing around, um, but even a, a little more deeply, the essential character of the laws that describe them is, uh, is most clear, most manifest uh, at very, very short distances or um, ultimately uh, uh, by studying what the, what the particles do at, at very high energies. Um, so that's a little bit odd, that, that, that the basic structure of the laws is, uh, is, uh, is defined at incredibly short distances, and yet the universe is an enormous and big place. Okay? Um, it's a little bit strange, but it might not, you might not think that it should keep you up at night. But it turns out that it needs to keep us up at night because, uh, because of a funny feature of, of quantum mechanics again. Um, uh, something you've probably all, all heard about is, uh, is this famous uncertainty principle of the Heisenbergs. Um, and one consequence of that is that if you try to probe very, very short distances and times, uh, you need to do it with, uh, with uh, collisions of particles at very, very high energies. So like that. Probe, like the, like, like that. Like so that. That's, that's why the LHC. So it, it's a wonderful irony, right? Uh, the LHC is the largest experiment uh, human beings have ever built, you know, every superlative you want you can attach to this <laughs> machine, largest, greatest, most people, right, most humongous detectors like that. Why? Why is it so big? Ironically, it's so big because it's designed to, to understand the laws of nature at the tiniest distances we've ever done before. And, and, and ultimately, the reason for that is this uncertainty principle of the Heisenbergs, that in order to probe shorter and shorter distances, we need higher and higher energies. When we smack the particles into each other at enormous energies at the LHC in order to do just that, uh, uh, we create new particles. And those, uh, like the Higgs, like lots of uh, other elementary particles we're more familiar with, perhaps other ones that we're going to hopefully uh, perhaps discover uh, when the LHC turns on again. And they come out. Um, uh, they come, especially when they typically decay back to ordinary particles. Those ordinary particles, because the guys came in at enormous energies, come out at enormous energies. So you have to put these gigantic contraptions around them uh, in order to stop them, study them in detail, and so on. So, so the, it, it's, 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 it's wonderful that the enormous size of these experiments is a direct reflection of what we're trying to do, which is to study the, the uh, tiniest uh, distances that, 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 we've, that we've ever, ever probed. So, um, but, but if, I, if I come back to, to, the, uh, uh, to, to the question of why there is a big universe, um, uh, we have these, uh, uh, because of the uncertainty principle, there is another phenomenon that uh, if you even look at empty space, what you would think of is the most boring thing possible. I, I, I try to examine what's going on here. Well, I suck out all the air molecules in the room. I'm really left with what, what you might think of as the vacuum. Okay? Um, well, even the vacuum can be exciting. Uh, and that's because if you try to check whether this region of space is really a vacuum, you need a microscope, um, or you need uh, a microscope like the LHC, this we'll come to in a second, but, uh, but just the act of probing very, very small distances needs higher and higher energies. And at some point, 
you have so much energy that you can create a particle and its antiparticle. Uh, the existence of antiparticles is one of the profound consequences, discovered by Paul Dirac, uh, is one of the profound consequences of putting together relativity and quantum mechanics, that every particle in nature has to have an antiparticle, exactly the same mass but opposite charge. And so that means that nothing stops you if you look at a really tiny region from producing an electron and a positron, for example. So your act of verif trying to check that this region is empty instead sees that it's, it doesn't look empty. It has an electron and, and, a, and uh, an electron and a positron comes out. In fact, if you probe more and more deeply, higher and higher energies, shorter and shorter distances, you see more and more of a roiling cloud of virtual particles and antiparticles just in the vacuum. So the vacuum itself is an exciting place. And, and accelerators like the LHC, which are often described as the world's biggest microscopes, uh, you can ask what they're looking at. What they're taking snapshots of is snapshots of the vacuum, of this roiling mass of uh, particles and antiparticles. But there are these enormous quantum mechanical fluctuations at shorter and shorter distances. And that's the origin of the problem, of why it's so difficult to understand why there's a big universe. We have enormous, this roiling mass of quantum fluctuations at very short distances. And then it makes you wonder why, if everything is fluctuating so violently, which it is, why does the universe over here look anything like it does over here, look anything like it does over there? And in fact, as we understand it in more detail, if you took the same group of theorists who we locked up in their room <laughs> and asked them to predict what the universe would look like, given the laws that we know, they would come to the conclusion that this violent mass of fluctuations would curl the universe up to a minuscule size. <laughs> billions and billions and billions and billions. I, I don't even know if I had enough <laughs> billions there, but as many billions as you like, smaller than it is. And they would also conclude that every single one of us would be uh, you know, a million, a thousand million million times heavier than we are, uh, and we'd all be collapsed into black holes. Okay? Uh, and none of that is true. We live in an enormous, wonderful, hospitable universe. None of us are black holes. And, uh, and this, is a, this, is, this does not follow in a simple way from our laws. In fact, we have to make seemingly absurd choices for some of these uh, parameters that describe what the laws of nature look like in order to just accommodate something as simple as why is there a big universe. So anyway, those are the two central questions, two of the central questions, I think what probably mm -hmm. most people would say are the two central questions of fundamental physics in the 21st century. What replaces space-time? Space-time is doomed ultimately, question one. And question two, why do we, why do we get this big universe when, uh, when there's this violent roiling mass of quantum fluctuations at, at, at tiny distances? That, that is a stunning point, though. As I said, we, we read so much in celebration. We hear on TV about how great these theories are. And then you hear, as you say, that the theoreticians, given their head here, pre predict that the universe is tiny. They get it, their size completely wrong. Right. Well, so, so the reason why this isn't a blatant contradiction, and also because... Uh, and also, uh, that we're not lying to you, uh, <laughs> is that there's that um, it, that uh, especially coming to this uh, coming to the second point of, of why the universe is big, there is something we can do to our equations to accommodate a large universe. When I said you lock up these these theorists in their room, uh, they would make an estimate for the size of the universe, and that estimate would be off by you know 60 decimal places. <laughs> so that's not so hot, right? But it, it, but it's an estimate. And if you went back and, and told them, you know what, uh, it's, the universe is actually 60 orders of magnitude bigger than you thought, <laughs> uh, they would say, oh, geez. Uh, and then they'd go back and say, well, there is this thing I could do to accommodate that. Right? Uh, but the thing that they could do to accommodate that is to pick some, some parameter here, like you know, the mass of the electron. And they'd pick some other parameter there, like the, I don't know, the, the strength of the gravitational force. Okay? Uh, and they'd say, uh, if I, if I adjust these two things relative to each other, um, there's some sort of, uh, there, there's some magic value uh, where I have to you know, very finely adjust these things uh, so that I can make the universe as, 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 big, as big as it is. But uh, in order to make this happen, we have to finally balance things against each other out to the 120th decimal place. <laughs> okay? uh, so, and that's really, that's, that's what we actually do. So, um, so uh, uh, for obvious reasons, this is called fine-tuning. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's like seeing a pencil standing on its... Uh, so, an analogy I use very often, it's like you walk into a room and you see a pencil standing on its tip uh, to within, you know, uh, uh, 0. 0.00000, 120 zeros 
uh, one degrees of vertical. Okay, it's possible. Nothing, that's, that's, that's a consistent configuration of pencil, right? Um, but if you saw it, you would think something is probably up, right? Um, you would maybe uh, look to see if, it's, uh, if the pencil is hanging from a string on the ceiling. Or maybe you look really carefully, you see there's a little hand holding it up. Okay. Or you, you look for something that would explain that funny state of affairs, even though it's not inconsistent. Okay? And so that's the state of affairs with our understanding of why the universe is big. Uh, the, our, the, the only understanding we can give for the largeness of the universe involves making a very fine, the very finely adjusted choice of, of, of the parameters of our theory. Um, and similarly with, with the, the closely related question of why we're not all black holes. Um, uh, why all the masses of, of, of all the elementary particles um, uh, uh, that we're made of, um, why, why, they're, why they're small enough so the force of gravity is weak enough so that we're not all collapsed into, uh, into, into black holes, that also involves a fine adjustment in, our, in the parameters of our theory to a mere 30 decimal places. Um, but that's why we suspect we're, we're missing something big. Mm. Uh, and that's also why I said it's not something mechanical about how the universe works, because once we take these basic facts as given, we can accommodate it. And we can accommodate it quite spectacularly. We can predict the existence of a particle that, uh, that, that, that we theorized about 50 years ago and then uh, finally discover uh, uh, in experiments uh, half a century later. Yeah. Uh, so at some level, we know what we're doing. Um, but, but, uh, but the questions that are left now, the new questions are, are the more structural ones about yeah. why we got those, that kind of universe to begin mm. with. And that seems deeply, deeply mysterious. Um, I was just wondering if you could expand on um, what you're saying about space and time and that non-existing, um, yeah. Did, did you hear that? Uh, yes. Yep. Uh, uh, so I was just making any jokes about not having the time to do it. So, <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, so uh, the, all the difficulties with space-time uh, have to do with the existence of both quantum mechanics and gravity, and there, there, there are various aspects of this. Uh, there, there are various aspects of this problem. I, I'll, I'll start with the with um, uh, I'll start with the most vivid one, although it's not the most important one from from some points of view. Um, the most vivid one is, is the following. So let's say we, we just we just talked a moment ago about how if you want to probe smaller and smaller regions in space. Uh, and time, you need higher and higher energies, like, like, like we do these experiments at, at the LHC. Um, and uh, in a world without gravity, there's no limit to the tiny distances you can probe in this way. You just have to find you know, larger and larger multinational governments to find <laughs> larger and larger accelerators, um, higher and higher energies to probe shorter and shorter distances. Uh, but because of gravity, something new happens eventually. Uh, which is that you end up putting so much energy into such a tiny region of space that you collapse the region of space you're trying to look at and study into a black hole. This is, this is a feature that, that many of you probably know about. If you put enough mass uh, in a small enough region, uh, then, then even light can't, uh, even light can't uh, escape from it. Um, uh, now, uh, and, and that stymies your attempt to uh, understand what's going on in that, in that tiny region of, uh, of space and time. Now, if you take what we know about gravity, um, you, can make a, you can make a prediction for when that would first happen. Uh, and the distances you have to probe uh, where that happens are around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Uh, that's a famous length scale known as the Planck length. And uh, to calibrate, uh, that length scale is, uh, you know, a, around 16 orders of magnitude smaller than what we're probing at the LHC. Okay. So uh, it's ridiculously, ridiculously, ridiculously tiny length scale, which is, um, uh, uh, and it, uh, which is related to the fact that gravity is an incredibly weak force compared to all the other forces we, we know of in nature. If you take, uh, you know, if you take two electrons, uh, they, have a, they gravitationally attract each other, and as like charged particles, they also repel each other, but the force of electric repulsion is, you know, a one followed with 42 zeros uh, times stronger than the, than the gravitational attraction. 
So the incredible weakness of, of gravity compared to all the other forces is related to the fact that you've got to go to these really minuscule distances before uh, the act of probing space and time collapses a region into a black hole. By the way, what, what if you get frustrated by the fact that you made this little mini black hole and decided to build an even bigger accelerator to use even higher energies? What happens? You make an even bigger black hole. <laughs> and uh, so there's just nothing you can do to probe uh, distances and times that start getting to this uh, Planckian territory. Now, you could take the attitude that, that space and time still exist, but you just can't measure them, right? Uh, but that attitude has never paid off in physics. Every time there's some concept that you can't even, in principle, never mind practical experiments, but you can't even, in principle, imagine uh, uh, sharply probing, it means that those ideas are approximate, and they somehow have to emerge from more primitive principles. But in this case, it's startling because the thing which has to emerge from more primitive principles are space and time itself. So that's the, that's, that's the, that's the simplest um, uh, origin of this uh, difficulty. Um, this general subject is, is the subject of uh, quantum gravity. Um, and it's sometimes described, I just want to say this uh, quickly, sometimes uh, the difficulties with putting quantum mechanics and gravity are described in a way that, that Graham sort of roughly alluded to a second ago, which, um, uh, which is that we have a great theory for the very small, um, which is quantum mechanics. We have a wonderful theory for a very large, which is uh, gravity, and we don't, know, uh, we don't know how to combine the two. And, and that's not quite accurate. Uh, in fact, uh, it, 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 if we want to describe the effects of quantum mechanical effects of gravity, at long distances, we know how to do it. We know how to calculate them. Uh, there are minuscule effects nobody cares about. But if you wanted to know what is the, what's the first tiny quantum mechanical correction to Newton's laws, we know what they are ahead of time. I can even show you a formula. It's got strange pies and factors <laughs> in it. You, you, you can be sure someone has done some work to get it. Okay? It's possible. Uh, the difficulties are not that we can't have the world of the large and the world of the small uh, um, uh, at the same time. Uh, uh, the real difficulty is we don't know what's going on with space-time at very short distances, and, uh, and, and, that, and, and that the idea of space-time has got to break down as we approach these, uh, these tiny uh, Planckian distances and, and times. One thing just to note of that, uh, if I may say, you're pretty well certain space and time have got to go, yeah? I, I think almost all of us are certain that space and time have got to go. Okay. Another question? Could we take the microphone here, please? So. so what's the LHC going to be used for in the future? Well, so um, uh, of these two questions, um, uh, the LHC is going to weigh in in a really significant way on the second one, why there is a big universe. And uh, the question of why there is a big universe is very close, is very intimately related to the Higgs particle. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and uh, there, there are actually two aspects to the problem of why there's a big universe. Uh, uh, first, why is the universe itself big? And secondly, why does it have these big things in it, like us and the Earth and things like that? And why aren't we all crushed to really tiny, minuscule black holes? Um, uh, and more specifically, the LHC is going to have something to say about that second question. Okay? Why, 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 the universe, why the big universe has big things in it? Um, that's related, as, 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 we, as we said, uh, to the question of why the elementary particle masses uh, are what they are and aren't much, much, much heavier than, than what they are. And that's ultimately, through a slightly indirect set of arguments, related to why the Higgs has the mass that it has. Um, and uh, the difficulty is that these wild quantum mechanical fluctuations in the vacuum that we talked about, um, while there's a very good reason uh, why they don't give an enormous mass to particles like the photon, uh, the particle of light, or particles like electrons and the quarks. There's going to be very good reason why these enormous fluctuations don't badly affect those guys. Uh, we have no good understanding for why they don't badly affect and make enormously more massive the Higgs particle. And if they made the Higgs particle enormously more massive, the entire consistency of the theoretical structure would require us to move everything up with it. So it's really the fact that we discovered the Higgs. On the one hand, it was, I, I made it sound inevitable. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's utterly shocking that something like the Higgs is associated with this physics. Uh, elsewhere in nature, uh, similar phenomena, I mean, not in exactly uh, the same setting, but sort of uh, analogous phenomenon to the ones that, uh, that, that, uh, that 
uh, that, that we probe at the LHC um, ha have been seen. Um, but nowhere uh, have they been associated with something like the Higgs particle. Okay? Nowhere, they've always been associated with much more complicated physics uh, and not something as astonishingly simple as a single particle, which on the other hand, we have no understanding for why its mass is where it is and not vastly, uh, not vastly heavier. So, uh, so there's two possibilities. Um, if I go back to my analogy uh, with the pencil standing on its tip, uh, the, the two possibilities were the ones we talked about. Either the pencil just is standing on its tip, which would be very strange, but it's, it's possible, or you find some mechanism that, that, that makes a seemingly unstable situation secretly stable, okay? like it's hanging from a string, or you, like, you see a little hand holding it up. And actually, the best analogy is like seeing a little hand holding it up, because it would say, if you look at sufficiently small distances, you'll see something new, which removes these big quantum mechanical uh, fluctuations. Mm -hmm. So um, most theoretical physicists for the last 20, 30 years have believed that it won't just look like it's finely tuned, um, and that we'll discover some mechanism. And this isn't just, uh, you know, it's not just an aesthetic hope. A number of times in the last 100 years, uh, two or three times in the last 100 years, we've been confronted with a similar situation uh, where there was an apparent fine-tuning, uh, and in every case, it turned out there was an explanation. There was the analog of the hand holding it up. Give us an example. So, one example well, of that? Well, there's one, one example is, is very, very analogous uh, to the situation with the Higgs. Uh, around 110 years ago, um, there, was a, there was a crisis in uh, theoretical physics involving uh, the electron. Okay? So the electron is a charged particle. Uh, you probably all remember from high school that it has, uh, you imagine that it's surrounded by an electric field. Uh, the electric field dies off as you go to larger and larger distances. But uh, you, also, uh, you, you also may know that there is some energy in that electric field, and you can, you can compute how much energy is in the electric field surrounding the electron. And if you imagine the electron as a point-like particle, uh, you, it's a point, you discover to your dismay that there's an infinite <laughs> amount of energy stored in the electron. Okay? And that's, that should really bother you, because then how the heck is it moving around if it's dragging this infinite amount of energy? With it, okay? <laughs> so something you could say, so again, something you could say is, well, there is that energy in the electric field, and there is some other energy, and they cancel against each other. I don't know where the other one comes from, but, but they just cancel against each other to give me the, the ultimate uh, value of the, of, the, of the mass, or the mass times c squared, uh, of the electron. Uh, and that's possible. That would be like seeing the pencil standing on its tip in the, uh, on the table. But what many theoretical physicists in the early part of the 1900s imagined is that no, it can't be like that. And there's got to be that, that there's got to be something has got to change the the logic of this argument. Now you can actually make an estimate for where something new has got to happen. You say, where, where do we get this infinity from? Uh, we got this infinite energy by imagining the electron as a point. So what's the most imaginative thing you could do? Say it's a little shell, right? It's not a point. <laughs> So if it's a little shell, then, then the energy won't be infinite. But you can ask how big would the shell have to be in order, just as an estimate, in order for this energy in the electric field not to be vastly too big. And people did this estimate, and it's a size that's around 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. Okay? Um, and they tried to make realistic theories like this, and they failed uh, badly. Uh, and today we know that's not the answer. Uh, something new does happen, but it's much more radical than they anticipated. In fact, it had to do with the discovery of quantum mechanics and particles and antiparticles and this whole picture we talk about about the roiling cloud of particles and antiparticles that surround the electron, which already at a much larger distance scale of 10 to the minus 11 centimeters remove this sort of classical point-like picture of the electron. So, but it's interesting that while their logic was wrong, uh, sorry, while their models were wrong, their logic was perfectly correct. Something new did happen. In fact, it happened 100 times earlier than it had to happen. Uh, uh, and, uh, and changed the, uh, the, the basic calculus of this discussion. So, uh, so many uh, theoretical physicists assume that the same thing is going to happen uh, uh, with the Higgs, and um, that has two exciting uh, consequences. Um, one is that there has to be something else. The Higgs can't be alone. The Higgs has to come along with some other particles. Okay? And two, those other particles can't be arbitrarily heavier than the Higgs. They have to be sort of right around the corner, right around where the Higgs is. Um, and uh, and that, that, that basic logic has, has guided much of the thinking um, uh, uh, in our field for the last 20 years. Um, so, uh, and, and three, I should say, 
uh, whatever this new physics is can't be some random garden variety junk. <laughs> it has a job to do. It has to do something which sounds like a tall order. It has to remove these violent quantum mechanical fluctuations in the vacuum that are ubiquitous part of, of quantum mechanics. So if it's, if it's going to manage to accomplish that, it has to have some, it has to have some really new structure, some idea in it. Uh, it's, not just some, some, uh, it's not just something random. So, uh, so that's what the LHC is looking for. It's looking for, uh, uh, are there new particles beyond the Higgs? Um, could those particles be associated with being the little hand that holds up the pencil, explaining why the mass of the Higgs is what it is? And if there aren't, if we don't see these new particles, and, and in a sense, uh, what we've seen at the LHC so far, namely we've discovered the Higgs, but none of these new particles yet, uh, while it hasn't ruled this idea out, uh, it's putting the idea that we will see particles like this under some more pressure than, uh, than, uh, than you would have naively expected, although from indirect reasons, many of us uh, are not particularly surprised about what's been going on so far because these new particles could have already put an appearance earlier in a variety of other places that we haven't seen. But, um, but it doesn't mean that, 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 that they won't show up. Um, so either we'll see particles like this and we'll have a good explanation uh, for why the Higgs is where it is, or we won't. And, and if we don't, it's an even bigger paradigm shift. If we don't, it's an even bigger sort of shock to the system because we would have really, uh, for, in a sense, for the first time, uh, really st st striking very hard to ignore evidence <laughs> that there is some fine tuning in, uh, in, in the parameters that go into describing the laws of nature. We haven't, there are other situations where we suspect we may be seeing things like that, but we're not completely sure. If we see it for the Higgs, it would be much concrete, much sharper evidence that something like that is going on. So we're at a very interesting bifurcation. We're at a very interesting fork in the road. Whatever the LHC sees, if it sees new particles, spectacular. Uh, if it doesn't see new particles, in a sense, even more spectacular, because it's, uh, it's an even bigger shock to the theoretical system. And we'll have to digest it and try to understand what it means. Well, how about that? How about that for an answer? Whatever that happens, it's going to be fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Another another question. question. Uh, microphone over here, please. A different sort of question. I just want to say how your job works. So, <laughs> so it feels like you describe. There's a lot of perspiration to what you describe. Right. Years of experiment. How does it, how does the sort of inspiration? He doesn't do experiments. I don't do the experiments at all. Thank so, God. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 no, I'm not. Think is, you know, unthinkable thoughts. Where? How do you go about doing that? This is I, a, I, so one of the quick questions. Did you get good odds on your bet? Uh, sorry. Did you get good odds on? Your I bet? did. I did. Uh, but but no one paid up. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, no. Um, no. So so it, it's 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 a very it's an, it's an excellent question. Um, uh, so first, there, there's experimentalists and theorists. And, uh, and again, in most parts of science, there isn't such a clear separation no. between experiment and theory. It's, it's, it's a consequence of how mature, I mean, we've been at this business, depending on how you count, for 2,000 years or, okay, that's giving the Greeks too much credit, but we really started with Galileo and Kepler and Newton for, for 400 some odd years. And uh, so it's by far the most mature of the, of the sciences. And so it's developed to a point where it makes sense to have experiment, people who specialize in experiment, people who specialize in theory. And our lives are very different. Uh, the experimentalists, uh, that, I mean, that, they have inspiration too. I mean, it's not just, just uh, someone has got to figure out how to build these humongous things and make them work. And, uh, and they're, I mean, I could, I could never do it in a million years uh, and, and there are absolutely extraordinary people who manage to do it. Mm. But it's a very different set of skills. It's a very different set of... The uh, people that built this uh, thing, uh, yeah, for example. Right, yeah. right. Fantastic. So, so, um, so uh, and it's definitely not just perspiration. There are some brilliant ideas needed to make every little component yeah. of that detector work. Yeah. Um, so, um, but, uh, but what theorists do is, is, is rather different. And you might get the impression um, that, uh, well, so we have these problems and we have to invent theories, right? We have to try to invent something that goes beyond what, what, what we know in order to attack them. Um, and you might get the impression that since the experiments take 50 years uh, to come along and confirm or deny a theory, that the job of a theorist is really easy, right? You just sit in your office, you put your feet up on your desk, and you invent a theory. Here's one. This is what's going on. Ah, they're not going to you know, verify for 30 or 40 or 50 years anyway, so I'll just have fun while they, and hey, here's another one, uh, here's another one, right? You just dream up, uh, as I sometimes like to say, you know, fairies and leprechauns and nymphs and dryads around every corner, uh, and then experiment comes along every 50 years, judgment day, and kills 99.99% of uh, ideas. But until that time, uh, there's a proliferation of crap. 
Um, and yeah, you might have that, 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 that impression. Um, I would that it were so. Okay? But in fact, uh, again, and this is closely related to why we separated an experiment and theory to begin with, um, things don't work that way. And the reason is exactly what I alluded to in the earlier uh, part of the discussion. What we already, we don't know the answer to all the questions. In fact, we have very profound mysteries. But what we already know about the way the world works is so constraining uh, that it's almost impossible, since we have to change something, right, in order to, we have to do something new, it's almost impossible to have a new idea, which doesn't destroy everything that came before it. Okay? So even without a single new experiment, just agreement with all the old experiments is enough to kill almost every idea that you might have. Okay? So for instance, this, this question about the kind of new particles that might come along that explain why the mass of the Higgs is what it is. Right? You might think, oh, today I get up, but once you go to grad school maybe, uh, you get up and you, you, you say, oh, this is the model. Here, here's something that can do it. Or you give them silly names uh, and, and, you, and you just keep making them up. In fact, in the 30 years that people worked on that problem, purely theoretically, as a theoretical problem, just try to find an idea that actually uh, uh, is the little hand that holds up the pencil. They found two classes of ideas that work. It's almost impossible to solve these problems. You can't roll out of bed in the morning and just solve them, precisely because we know so much already that anything you do is bound to screw everything up. <laughs> so if you manage to find one idea that's not obviously wrong, it's a big accomplishment. Now, that's not to say that it's right. <laughs> Right? <laughs> but not obviously being wrong is already a huge accomplishment in this, in this field. Um, and so that's the job of the theoretical physicist, is, is to try to come up with ideas that are not obviously wrong. Uh, and, and then hopefully you come up with, an, and, and it serves two roles. One of them is that one of them might end up being right. <laughs> the other one is that it, it, it directs experimentalists at where to look and the kinds of experiments to do. Uh, and, you know, these are enormous things that, uh, enormous machines that are made, enormous detectors, enormous resources go into them. We have to make sure that nothing is missed, right? And it will be one thing if there was just a barrage of crazy possibilities, but because of what I told you, it's not like that. And uh, so, anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's why we have a, a, a job and, and isn't trivial, okay? Uh, hi, yeah. just to go back to your previous comments about the kind of meaningless questions that we can ask in the English language and any other language for that matter. Um, I'm sure that it's quite a, it's a big thing to say in a way because most people in the world would probably disagree with you and say they are meaningful questions in some way. Uh, is it not possible that perhaps they're meaningless in the current paradigm of our scientific models rather than utterly meaningless, whether or not they could become meaningful if, if and when new theories come about mm. that can actually answer them? Mm. Good question. Good question. Uh, so, um, uh, so uh, I think, um, yeah. So if we unpack, if if we unpack what I said a little bit more, um, so obviously they're meaningful in some sense. They're meaningful in the English language. When I say they're meaningless, I mean they're meaningless statement. Uh, they're meaningless statements and statements about the universe, right? Uh, so, so let's say we take the statement I said that the uh, what is the position and velocity of that electron, right? Uh, I think. Perhaps it's, perhaps it's possible in some far off future theory that that might be a meaningful question. But it will only be a meaningful question if what we mean by position and velocity and electron change. Okay? If what we mean by those things or what we mean by them now, it is a meaningless question. And I think we can know that it is a meaningless uh, question given, uh, as a meaningless, it's a meaningless statement, it's a meaningless question about, about the universe. So this is something important, again, that, that, uh, that, that, uh, that the, that the that the, uh, often the concepts that end up being relevant, that we end up needing uh, to understand things more deeply, are so foreign to, uh, to the ideas we have now that we can't even articulate the correct question before we happen to be in the neighborhood of the right answer. <laughs> okay? And that's, that's, that's a, it's a fascinating thing about the way uh, this part of science works. Uh, that's, that's completely not like the, 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 the sort of cookie cutter description that someone makes a hypothesis and then an experimentalist goes and it checks whether the hypothesis is true. Yes, you're right. No, you're not right. They go back, they make another hypothesis. I mean, it's this ridiculous picture of how science works is not <laughs> remotely close to the truth. And in fact, especially in, in, in this business, uh, uh, especially involving, uh, involving deep conceptual questions, 
as I said, we don't even know if we're asking the right question until we happen to be in the vicinity of the right answer. And the carp becomes, carp, uh, it comes before the horse a lot. And very often, uh, we have the correct equations for a number of years before we know what they mean. And uh, so, so nothing works in this uh, straightforward, uh, nothing works in this straightforward way. But, but that means that we always have to be wary about, uh, about uh, what precisely the words are supposed to mean. Okay? And now, today, we have, a, we, we, we have a precise thing that we mean by electron. Even what we mean today by the electron is not quite what was meant 100 years ago by the electron, because they didn't know about quantum mechanics then, and we know something yeah. about quantum mechanics now. So it won't be very useful to you, but, uh, but what I really mean when I say the electron right now is an irreducible representation of the Poincaré group with spin half. Okay? That's not something that, J I mean, it doesn't mean anything to you, maybe, maybe it does, but that's not the way J.J. Thompson, who discovered the electron, no. would, uh, would uh, describe it. So even the same word, which for good reasons, of course there are very good reasons to keep calling it the electron, because it's the, it's the quantum version of that thing that he discovered, uh, which, was what the, what the, uh, uh, which is associated with the language I just used to uh, describe it. Um, uh, but we have to continually update what our words mean as we learn more about nature. So I'll come back and say what I said, therefore. It, it's conceivable, now I think it's incredibly unlikely and there's lots of reasons to believe that, uh, that we're never going to return to these deterministic pictures of the world and we'll never, uh, that, that there's no more primitive theory underlying quantum mechanics in that, at least in that sort of uh, uh, simple-minded way. Uh, but if there is some miraculous loophole, then, um, then that sentence will only make sense if every word in it means something completely different than what it means now. It's a deep question. One, one last question, if it could be a short question, and, and Nima can answer it briefly. Yes, please. There's it passed over here, thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, I wanted to ask you about that space-time theory being out the window. Why is it a problem, and why has discovering that created these issues. I'm no Sorry, which, which, which has gone out the window, sorry? The space-time. Just well, space-time. Yeah, well, what, you said space-time's over, it's dead, that kind of, that right. theory. You know? Right, well, it's not a theory. I mean, that, that uh, what, what uh, yeah, that's, well, that, that, that's it, it's, it's, it's a problem. Uh, so, so um, uh, well, uh, the, the idea of space-time is one of the two pillars of our current understanding of physics. Uh, so there was relativity and quantum mechanics. Relativity really means that there's, there's space-time. Um, and I, I, as, as I, as I uh, waxed on about at length, uh, you take these two basic ideas of space-time and quantum mechanics and the rest of the universe largely follows. Uh, so that's, that's, that's wonderful to have such a deep principle which has so many profound consequences, which makes it more painful to realize that that idea can't, somehow is, is itself an approximation to a something else. Um, but it's not a theory. We have a specific, you know, uh, uh, it's a mystery. It's a, it's, 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 it's a difficulty. Uh, we can do thought experiments where we try to measure distances and times to very small distances like we just did, and we discover that it doesn't make sense. And we don't know what does make sense yet. So we're always in that situation in, in, in our business, that there are things we understand very well, and there are things that we don't understand, and we have to, obviously we have to go, we have to, go to the funny uh, intersection between them and try to clean things up. Um, and uh, so these kind of arguments that I made, and by the way, one of the wonderful things about, uh, one of, one about, one of the wonderful things about fundamental physics today is that the way I describe the difficulties with uh, uh, space-time to you is not far from the way I describe it to a graduate student. Um, and, and also the, the difficulty with why there is a large universe, it's not far from there. I mean, it's not, they're very closely related to our actual official technical understanding of what the problems are. Uh, the basic difficulties are big. They're simple to state, and they're big. And that's, that's, all, that's been the characteristic of the profound questions that have driven the development of physics for hundreds of years. The basic issues are simple and big and easy to state. The possible answers are not so easy to state often, but, but the questions are, are simple to, uh, to motivate. And so, but anyway, the reason we care is because space-time has served us shockingly well, and it's going to be painful to lose it. <laughs> but it's also a big clue that we have to lose it somehow. And, and, and it's also good in many other ways. You see, there, there are things we don't, we, we don't understand what happens as we take our expanding universe and evolve it back in time and eventually run into these singularities at the Big Bang. 
these sort of deepest questions about origins, about why we got the universe we got, and, and so on, um, it, it's somehow, it's at least good that we're confused about the idea of time itself, because it gives an opportunity that perhaps understanding that the general question might shed some light on these uh, other questions that we also care about uh, at the same time.